Trust the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program, LawPay. The practice of law has changed significantly in the past decade, and perhaps the biggest disruption arrived in March when the coronavirus pandemic forced most lawyers to leave their offices and work remotely. There have been challenges and fears for the profession, as well as the necessity to quickly change the way something has always been done. That's hard for lawyers. As part of a special series, the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered is asking lawyers about how they've done it and what they think will come next. I'm Stephanie Francis Ward, and my guest today is Beth Borden, a Florida public defender who represents homicide defendants, and she's also an expert on FOIA matters and has worked with journalists, including Ken Klippenstein of The Nation. Beth, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course. Can you tell us, how did you get involved with helping people with FOIA requests? Because that seems to be somewhat different than uh, defending murder cases. Yeah, it's quite the opposite, actually. I was on Twitter and I had been following Ken Klippenstein and he posted something along the lines of trying to get documents from the FBI regarding an event and the FBI was stonewalling him on providing these documents. And I suggested that perhaps from my reading of the events, perhaps he could get the things that he's looking for from local law enforcement, which was an angle that he hadn't ever really considered. So that's how we started talking. And then at some point along the way, he asked me if I would be interested in filing FOIA lawsuits for him. And it happened to perfectly coincide with a time when I had a client who was facing the death penalty who we were trying to get his immigration file. And unfortunately, the client didn't have all of the information that the government wants filled out on the form, and we were having difficulty in in getting his file. So it happened to perfectly coincide. And I said, you know, this, this would be great because it looks like I'm going to have to sue for his file. Let's do this. And here I am now. We're on our third federal lawsuit. And about what year was that? This was 2019 when I filed the first lawsuit on Ken's behalf, and that one was with also with Talia Lavin. I would say probably it was earlier in 2019 when I had suggested, or even late 2018, when I had suggested going to law enforcement, local law enforcement, to get documents where feds were involved. And how does that work with your PD position? You can still represent people on FOIA matters? As long as I am not representing someone for pay on a criminal matter, the Florida statutes regarding public defenders and what they can do, it, it from my reading, I'm only prevented from representing someone on criminal matters. So once the day is over, I can do work on it at night. I can do work on it on weekends. If there happens to be a time when I have to have a hearing on one of these cases during a regular workday, I just take annual time off. I see. And I was curious, on the one hand, I would imagine that if you are a criminal defense attorney, there may be a fair amount of FOIA work or just trying to get documents to help defend your client. But also, I think so often In criminal defense work, it's like the less said, the better. You know what I mean? So I was curious (laughs) if those two things ever go is seeking all of the truth versus that that criminal defense um, wanted the less said, the better. And do those two things ever like go against each other in your head? Well, there are some times where maybe it's not my client that I'm seeking the full truth on. There are plenty of other people who get involved in these cases that their credibility is a bigger issue than my client's credibility. Yeah. So I'm I'm using it for a lot of state witnesses. But here and there, you have a client where the further you dig, the more helpful it is. There was one case where I learned of a document that I didn't know existed. I guessed that something might exist. You know, every time law enforcement speaks into the radio that's clipped to their shoulder, that produces an electronic record somewhere. And Ah. so I figured if that produces a record and someone's trying to call in a client name to have their name run through the system, somewhere along the line, 
their name being run through the system has to create a document of its own. And there should be a big list of every time that that's happened with each individual. That was my hope. And um, sure enough, there is such a thing. And I don't know what the initials stand for, but in Florida, it's called a TAR. So here and there, I come across new documents that are produced. That was the one that was most helpful for a client in, in digging was a TAR. Okay. So journalists looking for government documents the government doesn't want to share and criminal defense attorneys looking for government documents that the government doesn't want to share that help your client. Those are actually pretty similar then. Yes. Yes. Okay. I know that you have a Patreon platform for FOIA, which I thought was fascinating. I've only really listened to podcasts on Patreon, which I know you have a podcast now too. How did you come up with the idea to do that? Well, I don't have a podcast yet. To file a FOIA lawsuit costs $400. Mm. At some point, if you win or you're partially the victor, the government reimburses attorney fees and the filing fees. And it's another story as to how long it takes to get all of that out of the government. But it's $400 to file a suit. And then you mm -hmm. have to send that lawsuit out via certified mail, which that's around 7 to $8 per mailing. And you have to send it to at least three places when you file it. So there was an idea at some point in... Ken and I were putting out a lot of records requests, and a lot of these requests were coming back from states seeking several thousand dollars. And so at some point, Ken and I started discussing, well, you know, we want to be able to get some of these records and pay for them. We want to be able to file more lawsuits. Where is this money going to come from? And then we just decided on Patreon. It looked like a good platform. It looked like something where you know, people could do a one-time donation if they wanted, or they could do a continuing one until they decide to no longer support our work, that it just seemed to be a, a great place to start. So I opened that October 5th, and it's doing pretty well. Will you tell us how much uh, it has raised so far? So far, it started off very small. The first disbursement... Okay, the disbursements come every month, once a month on the anniversary date of when I started it. So for October, when it first started, that disbursement came in, in November on the 5th. And that first one was like somewhere around like $370. And then the mm -hmm. next one was somewhere around $1,500. And then January, it was around $2,600. And then this most recent one was about $2,500. So all of that money, I take out money for taxes and set that aside because it's getting attributed as income to me. So I set aside money to pay taxes on, on that. And then the rest of it is sitting in, I guess, what you could call maybe a war chest. Um, so <laughs> right now, um, I think we have around $4,600 to spend on records, lawsuits and anything needed to create any of those items. And when you said sometimes the states wanted thousands of dollars, you're referring to when they grant a request, but they charge you for what they give you. Yes, the states okay. are the most ridiculous that I've ever seen. They charge one place charged $58 per hour to search <laughs> for the documents and then to redact these documents. And, <laughs> and they claim that it would be several days worth of searching. And, you know, we're getting, we're getting things back from like here in Florida, from Massachusetts that are in the 3000 to $5,000 range. And that's, that's just ludicrous. You have priced me out of the market because I'm not taking that $4,600 and blowing it all on one set of records that can right. get redacted to, into oblivion. So you're pricing me out of the water. And if you're pricing me out of the water and I have a Patreon, what about activists? What about journalists who are freelancers? You're pricing everyone out of being able to get access to records that they're entitled to. Is there any case law on that? Has that been an issue that's been brought up? Well, with states, like I concentrate on Florida because Florida is where I am licensed. 
So here it's sort of what's a reasonable fee and and they try to delineate what is and what is not reasonable. But if you try to get the court involved in it, all the court's going to say is something along the lines of, you know, um, maybe you agency should take a better look at whether your your fee is too high. What's the actual incentive there for the agency to then respond with, oh, you, you know what, Your Honor, you're absolutely right. Maybe we are a little bit high. That That's not a thing that's going to happen. <laughs> right. I'm curious because I think a lot of journalists would like to do FOIA requests, but they don't really know how. And when the agency says no, that's kind of that. I'm curious, are the agencies surprised when they see that you're helping? I don't think the agencies actually know that I'm involved until there's an issue where the agencies are seeking clarification. Um, Mm. So the... I help Ken. We file our FOIA requests to the agencies. We do that via email. I then track them to see, has there been a response? Do we have a tracking number? Have we been given an estimated date of completion? Have we been told, yes, there are responsive records? Have we been denied based on some something that the agency felt was a proper area for denial. So I track all of that. And here and there, an agency will respond seeking clarification. And I would try to get them to talk to me. And and they would they would be like, who is this? And I said, I'm calling on behalf of Ken Klippenstein. And then they would get very confused because all they're hearing is they think now that I'm Ken and I'm obviously a female voice. And (laughs) it's pretty comical. But now I there's a lot of agencies who have decided we'll go ahead and we'll talk to you and I don't have to pretend to be Ken. So, (laughs) (laughs) so they are willing to work with me, but it seems to be over the phone. I'm not as known as Ken is. He's sort of a prolific filer, but a few places are getting to know me. And are you, when it gets to that point, are you dealing with the agency's counsel? this in charge of FOIA, or rather that someone who's not a counsel who's just tasked with pulling information? What it appears to be to me, and this is just from looking at various people's signature blocks, it appears that most of these agencies have attorneys who are the ones pulling the records and then reviewing them for redactions and are the ones that are interpreting the various FOIA requests. Now, some of these agencies, it does appear that the attorneys are employees of the actual agency, but some of these agencies contract out their FOIA work. And so some of these attorneys that I'm speaking to are people who work for a contractor. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Are the FOIA requests getting sold walled with the pandemic, either as an excuse or because it's legit? No, people are not in the office to pull the records or they say, well, no, can't help you. You know, I sort of find it to be disingenuous when they try to claim that the pandemic is somehow responsible for a delay because I'm sending these requests via email, which these agencies have access to their email, regardless of whether they're doing telework. So the request is going to them via email. They are searching electronic databases. They're not searching some, you know, big metal filing cabinet that's in some dusty basement. Thank goodness, yeah. (laughs) So they're using it as an excuse with staffing more than anything to claim that they don't have as many workers available to do this. It also appears that they're trying to claim that with the pandemic that that has has cost them some some access to some things but i i just i i don't believe that that that's the case i think these agencies have always been really bad about responding prior to the pandemic and they will continue to be bad about responding after the pandemic and it seems like the only thing that gets them working and responding for a while is to sue them yeah well, do you think once things, I don't want to say get back to normal because who knows what that even means anymore, but once 
there's more people with vaccinations and less of the risk to get coronavirus. What are we going to see? Is there just going to be huge amounts of, of great information that journalists can FOIA what happened during the pandemic? And I, is there going to be huge amounts of information to FOIA for, you know, criminal defense attorneys like yourself, as we're just going to see a lot of stuff from this time period and government documents that the government may not want to share with us? I don't think we're going to see anything that's related to solely the pandemic start to rise unless we learn something that we don't already know. Ken had put in several requests to the Defense Intelligence Agency last year in March, seeking a lot of various documents that would be related to the pandemic. And I think there were a total of five requests that were that were put in via email. And this past week is when the Defense Intelligence Agency replied back to acknowledge, number one, receipt of emails from March of 2020, and then to invoke a 10-day extension because they're just not going to be able to get this done within the statutory time frame of 20 days. And it's it like it's comical to me because it's it's a year old and you're invoking an extension. Uh, that's crazy to me. Right. But everybody has been seeking pandemic related documents all along the way. Presidential briefings are being sought. So I don't think there's going to be some big rush and new amount of pandemic related items sought unless we learn something shocking that we that we haven't known about to then request all of this new stuff. And do you have a sense, the answer may be, it depends. But if you're making a FOIA request, do you think it's a good idea to ask for everything or to have a very narrow focus? It depends on what your timeline is. If you need something quickly and you don't have the ability to file a lawsuit for it, the best thing that you can hope for is to be placed on a simple track because a simple track gets taken care of and and gets the documents to you much quicker than if you get stuck on a complex track with the agency. So if you want to to be on a simple track, requesting records that have already been pre-processed and and provided via FOIA to someone else in the past, we'll put you on a simple track and we'll get you documents right away. Requesting something as narrow as possible with a, within a narrow time frame and providing keywords for the narrowing of the search can also put you on a simple track and get you the documents quicker. So it, it depends on your timeline as to as to what you want. But me personally, I have a Patreon, so we can sue them if we need to, if they're taking too long. We want everything. We We aren't narrowing anything down for them. Okay. I know you've been working with journalists. And now that you're kind of known for doing this, do you help other criminal defense attorneys too on this? I mean, they're lawyers, so they kind of know, but they I don't think they've many have done it as much as you. I'm in several Facebook groups that are their local criminal defense attorneys. And then there's one group of us that are sort of statewide. And that one's usually for like attorney coverage, but it sometimes gets used for requests. So in those groups, I'm able to help people sometimes But most of them that do criminal defense, they, generally speaking, know what they can get from law enforcement already because of discovery that we receive. We have very good discovery laws here in Florida. So the documents that we get from the state attorney's office during our cases has so many items to it that spending time working as a criminal defense attorney, you know what kind of documents you should be seeing and what are produced. And so you already start from a pretty good place of knowing what you can ask for. You know, we all help each other with stuff. When, like, I found out about the TAR, I told everybody I knew, hey, did you guys know this exists? And so that everybody else would then have that available to them as well. No one's really sought any federal FOIA help from me, but Mm -hmm. they all know, and they're all very impressed with my Twitter. So um, I'm sure you have like (laughs) 42,000 followers. 
I think I'm almost, I think I jumped up to 49 now. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, I feel like I should have 1,000 for every year I am old, which I should be having 51,000 any day now. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Well, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I, one of the things I want to ask you about is how you joined and then pretty quickly got kicked off Parlor this summer. We'll be right back. As the ability to accept payments online becomes an increasingly essential part of your practice, LawPay provides your firm with a proven and trusted solution. With LawPay, you receive a simple, secure way to accept client credit cards and e-check payments from anywhere. LawPay understands unique compliance requirements placed on attorneys, which is why their solution was developed specifically to correctly separate earned and unearned fees and protect the IOLTA accounts from any third-party debiting giving you peace of mind that your transactions are always handled correctly. Visit lawpay.com slash ABA to learn more. And we're back. I'm Stephanie Francis Warren. And on today's episode of the ABA Journal's Asked and Answered, my guest is Beth Borden. She is a Florida public defender who represents homicide defendants. And she's also an expert on FOIA matters and has worked with uh, journalists in terms of getting what they want. So Beth, you joined Parler this summer and then you got kicked off. Can you tell us a little bit about <laughs> Parler and what your experience was? I did. So Parler started getting big and there were a group of us that we're part of a group chat on Twitter that we decided, let's just test how free this speech is on this new app. I'm going to jump in for a moment because Parler was basically billed as a site for people who saw themselves as conservative and felt like Twitter was not for them or they got kicked off Twitter. Is that basically right? Right. Yes. They were okay. whining that their conservative voices were being stifled on Twitter. So they were going to create their own app and it was going to be much better than Twitter and they would have free speech. And so a group of us decided, let's go in and test how free this speech is over on Parler. So I would say somewhere around like 15 to 20 of us joined Parler. I lasted the longest out of the entire group of us. I lasted three full days. And once I was banned at day three, I didn't try to sign back up using a virtual private network or anything like that. But a couple of my friends did, and they just kept getting banned every single day. But it's all a bunch of the conservatives that have been kicked off of Twitter and a couple of liberals who were kicked off of Twitter. I don't know if you know who the the Krasensteins are, but they were on Parler. So it was super fun to get to see Ed and Brian again. <laughs> and um, so I was on there and there's a woman from England. Her name is Katie Hopkins. And she's, there's no way I can say anything nice about her. So I'm not going to pretend she, to me, she's a garbage human being, but I was replying to her, and on Parler, those are called a parlay. And I was replying to her in the same manner that I used to reply to her on Twitter. And I replied to her with a photo that I obtained from Twitter. And um, that photo is what got me banned because it depicted sexual content. Twitter, you know, is much freer than Parler, I can tell you that. But that's how I got banned, was sending Katie Hopkins a picture of herself having sex in a field with a man who at that time was not her husband and was someone else's husband. You couldn't see any genitalia whatsoever, but you knew what was going on. And some some paparazzi or something had, had taken that photo and I had found it on Twitter. And then when you send it to Katie over there on Parler, you get banned. Okay. I think that's interesting because a lot of lawyers wouldn't do that. Could you kind of tell me, I mean, what? <laughs> well, it, and that's absolutely right. And there are many times every single day where I think to myself, I should really be more professional. But I just, I don't know. I just can't help myself really. And I think that's part of the draw and why I have so many followers on Twitter is I'm just not what you would expect an attorney to be. I'm not stuffy. I'm very chill. 
I don't think that I'm smarter than anybody else in the world. I will tell everyone on Twitter that I'm an idiot. And, you know, I don't know a lot about a lot of things that the only thing I know about is criminal law in Florida, and I know some FOIA law. And so I, I think that everyday casual nature that I have is is what's the draw and why why people follow me. Now, I, over the years, have interviewed a lot of people who are lawyers who claim to be Twitter experts. And it, I'm just kind of giggling right now because I want to ask you, do you have any advice for lawyers who want to be uh, market themselves on Twitter? Because <laughs> that, that, that's a hot topic. But as you know, as we said, you were doing some things that many lawyers wouldn't feel comfortable with. So it sounds kind of funny, but I do want to ask you that question. Yeah, I, I can't help anyone who actually wants to market their firm and make Twitter something where their firm becomes a big known account because that's just in in my experience that's not going to work for them to get followers like right <laughs> you know no one cares what your law firm does on Twitter they care about are you funny do you have something smart to say and if you do have something smart to say as a law firm, then most of Twitter doesn't care about that either. So if you want to get big on Twitter, you can as an attorney, but your law firm, you need to go on Facebook or do something else or, you know, work on getting your web page to be number one on a Google search because Twitter is just not going to be something where you can build your entire firm off of it. Well, and perhaps if maybe someone wanted to be a bit more genuine, oftentimes people talk about the sweet spot of getting the word out about your legal work, but also showing your personal side. And I know that sounds like kind of a cornball question, but do you have, because I think that is hard for people, you know, they want to, they want to be active on Twitter, but it's hard to know like, what to put out there about yourself and not be a windbag, not say anything that you get dragged for. And maybe that's maybe that's it, is if you want to do well on Twitter, you can't be afraid to get dragged. But do, you know what I mean, that sweet spot yeah. we're looking for about personality and expertise and likability. I think that you have to be willing to say something dumb. And I think as attorneys on Twitter, you have to be willing to shut up. Like there are plenty of things that you just don't need to weigh in on, especially if you don't know what you're talking about. And that's where attorneys have a really hard time. There's some joke somewhere about how do you know who in a room is an attorney? You don't have to. They'll tell you. <laughs> I think that like you can leave in your bio that you're an attorney, but you know, if every post is, well, I as an attorney think you're going to have a bad time. You know, you just have to be laid back, be yourself, get a group of people who sort of know you and interact with that group of people. And then that's where people can start seeing, OK, yeah, you're real. And then here and there, weigh in on something where you actually know you're talk what you're talking about. And that can help you. And then it'll help you with networking. And of course, networking can then get you the business that you're that you're hoping for from Twitter. I'm curious, have any attorneys you know in private practice ever asked you to retweet something for them? Yes. And someone was asking me for advice so that his law firm could do better. And he's a super nice guy. And I do like him. And, and a couple of my friends work with him. So I, I think he's great. But he would tweet something out. And I was like, this is just terrible. You have to redo this. And I would tell him, okay, here's what you do. And then he would tweet it again and it was just terrible. And so I finally got one that wasn't that bad and I retweeted it. And then I started kind of making fun of him with Ken. And then Ken went to his page and, you know, everybody will make a mistake and they'll try to post like a YouTube video and it, it comes out and everything's all screwed up. So mm -hmm. Ken saw like a million of those and he thought those were funny. And that's what Ken retweeted then. And so it was just a spectacular disaster. What did your friend think? <laughs> 
He replied once that had happened, he replied with the correct link. But at that point, he didn't ask me for help anymore. <laughs> um, but he would say things like, oh, your Twitter is doing great. And I'm like, yeah, my Twitter is doing really good. And like all of my Facebook friends and all my local friends, they just get so excited when they see something of mine on some other medium. Like if they come across something that I tweeted that's been posted onto like a, a meme generator sort of thing on mm-hmm. Instagram, mm-hmm. or they see me in some Facebook group that I'm not a part of. One of my tweets there, like they'll, they all text them to me and they're like, Oh my God, you're famous. <laughs> Have you had any tweets that you regret or took down? And if so, why? I frequently regret, regret tweeting things, but I don't take anything down unless it's hurtful to to people or to a community. You know, here and there, you tweet something and, and you don't see how it might be interpreted by other people. And so, you know, if someone notifies me and says, hey, you know, I really like you, but I, I think that your tweet looks like it could be a little bit ableist and they explain why, that helps me. Absolutely, I, I don't want to tweet something that hurts a community or a group. And so I have taken a couple down. And otherwise, what I mostly regret is, you know, like you'll post something and you don't notice that your feet are in the photo and, you know, and then you get like a million DMs with people wanting to buy feet pics like that. <laughs> That's the kind of regret that I mostly experience is just, you know, or you don't think something all the way through and people are like, you know, they're shocked that you said something on a specific topic that they didn't think that you would ever weigh in on. And then you, you know, or if you tweet the words sugar daddy and you didn't mean that you want a sugar daddy, but you use that phrase and you get like 10 DMs you know, from oh. sugar daddies, like that's okay, like, good to know. there's has okay. to be bots <laughs> searching those words. So those are the kind of things that I really um, <laughs> regret more than anything else. That's just fascinating. I was curious too. I mean, you said you defend people who are charged with homicide. Yeah, That is really heavy, hard work. Does your online life with the Twitter accounts and the FOIAs, does that, is that kind of a stress reliever? It is helpful to me because it's quite depressing what I do. Every single client that I have faces life in prison, many of them being charged with first degree murder, which is capital felony. That's mandatory life if convicted as charged. Judge has no sentencing options whatsoever. It can get super depressing. And I had some clients who were facing the death penalty and I'm super thankful to Aramis Ayala when she was leaving the state attorney's office and it was switching over to Monique Worrell. That's the PD in your county? That's in my county. That's Orange County, Florida. I Um, see. The judicial district is two counties, though. Um, Okay. So it's the state attorney for Orange and Osceola counties in the Ninth Judicial Circuit of Florida. So when Aramis was leaving and it was switching over to Monique, Aramis withdrew the death penalty on my two cases. And I, I couldn't be more thankful. And that helped a lot. It relieved a lot of pressure, but it still wasn't as helpful as the side project that I have doing FOIA and having the ability to just interact like I'm a normal everyday person with people on Twitter. Those are, are super helpful to me because otherwise it's it's extremely depressing. And the cases they're not really moving because of COVID. So, you know, clients, they're not entitled to bond. They're sitting there longer than than they ever hoped to be with not a lot moving. The cases will take a good year and a half to two years to work up anyway, to work them up properly. But they're at least used to seeing more happening during that time frame or going to court for things. And that's just not happening right now. So they're depressed. I'm depressed. And yeah, FOIA is nice. No one's getting life in prison. You know, maybe I don't get my documents or or the FBI wants $820 to provide 55 CDs. That's, you know, it's easier mentally 
than someone that you're very attached to facing life in prison. Yeah. That's everything I have for you today, Beth. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was really interesting speaking with you um, about Twitter and FOIA and all those things. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This has been great. And listeners, thank you for joining us as well. If you like what you heard today, please rate us an Apple podcast. We'll see you next time for another episode of the ABA Journals Asked and Answered.